So any questions from our last lecture? We essentially talked about how to generate rays uh, and how to uh, uh, intersect with two simple primitives, a plane and a sphere. Actually, I'm going to step outside for just a moment. Pardon me, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry, I didn't know you can, because I was like, I want to... I mean, really clearly we can't do that, okay? okay so if you have those on your machine, I'm going to ask okay. you to erase them, okay, yeah. and uh, I'll trust you, but, but yeah, it's really, it's, it's, it's not like, a great scenario. I, I, was like, uh, I, I have to teach lecture, but I, I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, so, let's talk about uh, ray casting for other primitives. Oh, sorry, any questions about our last lecture? A little chaotic today, the meeting of class. <laughs> okay, excellent. Luckily, today's material is fairly straightforward, so a little bit of a late start is okay. All right, so today uh, we're going to talk about intersecting rays with triangles, which is basically the only computation you're ever going to need in computer graphics rendering, because what do we do if we don't have a triangle? Yeah, we triangulate. Yeah, we take a surface, we tessellate it with little triangles, uh, and we already saw that that's a perfectly reasonable approximation of most shapes. Okay? Um, and thankfully, once I've detected that I've uh, intersected a ray with a triangle, notice that my rendering code is exactly the same as what we did last time, right? Because the triangle is just a little chunk of a plane. Right? So the only thing that's missing right, is I can detect whether a ray hits the plane of a triangle. We already talked about how to do that. But we got to figure out whether, when it hits that plane, it's in the inside of the triangle or not. Does that make sense? Cool. And the way that we're going to do that is using barycentric coordinates. This is one of my favorite topics as a geometry person. Um, we're going to talk about classical barycentric coordinates in this class. If you like fancy geometry topics, search for uh, generalized barycentric coordinates, which is what's sitting behind, like, you know, in Photoshop, some of these other tools, you can, like, draw a cage around an animated character and start dragging the cage and the character moves with it. Um, essentially, those are some generalized version of the story that we'll tell today, okay? So, uh, in any event, our, our basic uh, task here is to intersect a ray with a triangle. So, how do we define a triangle? Let's start easy. Well, I think three points is a pretty reasonable way to do it. We'll call those A, B, and C, or probably given my inconsistency with notation in this class because I'm sloppy, it'll move around, but I'll, hopefully not today. Um, so if I want to have a point on the triangle plane, one way that I can write it is as a weighted average of A, B, and C. Does that make sense? So in order to be a weighted average, right, so it's like alpha times A plus beta times B plus gamma times C, what do I need? I need one additional condition, which is that alpha plus beta plus gamma equals one. Yeah? Is it degenerate triangle just like a line or a point? Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, yeah, I, mean, I wouldn't worry about that, that boundary case a whole lot in, in this class. If you take a uh, pewter index uh, geometry class, then like, those things are going to create a huge amount of headache. But in any event, um, yeah, so that's our definition. But notice that, like, for instance, there's nothing stopping me so far from having alpha equals minus 10 and gamma equals plus 10, and I guess in that case, beta equals 1. Yeah? And what, what will that point be if I have like, a negative number in one of my coordinates? But they sum up to 1. Yeah. Um, it'll be something that's still on the plane. Exactly, right? So, uh, again, think of alpha, beta, and gamma as like averaging weights, which is why they sum up to one. And if one of them is negative, it's saying go outside of the triangle. Okay. Um, right, so, uh, yeah. There are a lot of different ways to parameterize planes. Probably the way that you're used to seeing a plane is like a source point plus two directions. And you can get there from this uh, relationship, right? So uh, one way to do it is to notice that I added that constraint alpha plus beta plus gamma equals 1, right? So if I want, I can write um, my plane as just a function of beta and gamma, right? Because I know that alpha is just 1 minus the other two, right? So this is, equal, this is like 1 minus beta minus gamma A plus beta B plus gamma C. And now I can just pull out, um, I can factor it by the coefficient instead of by the vector here, right? And if I do that, then I'll get what? I'll get A plus um, beta times B minus A plus gamma times C minus A, right? All I did was this algebra. And what's the picture that I should have in mind here? So if this is A, B, and C, 
right? Then like b minus a is this vector, c minus a is this vector, right? So this is the sort of usual formula for a plane that we have. So all I've done is just reshaped the formula of a plane in terms of three points instead of one point and two vectors. That's all. Okay. Cool. So, uh, right. So let's, uh, let's keep going here. First of all, is this an explicit or an implicit definition of a, of a triangle? How many vote implicit? How many vote explicit? Darius is right, right? Because there's a, a map here from alpha, beta, gamma into points on the plane, right? This is an explicit formula. Okay, so, uh, right, and, 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 and a, a nice sort of um, phrase that people use is that the point P uh, is sometimes called a weight, usually a weighted barycenter, because it's sort of a weighted average of the A, B, and C, and if I put weights, like literally fishing weights, that, whose, whose uh, size is proportional to these numbers, that would be the point where the triangle would balance, that's where that term comes from. Typically when people say barycenter without saying weighted barycenter, they mean specifically where alpha, beta, and gamma are all one-third. Okay, right, so uh, if we just want points on the inside of the triangle, we need one additional constraint, which is that alpha, beta, and gamma are all greater than or equal to zero. Yeah, and notice that as sort of a corollary, the, uh, one of the things that you can uh, figure out is that all these numbers have to be between zero and one. Does that make sense? Because notice that like, for example, gamma is one minus alpha minus beta, right? So if uh, all of these numbers are positive, in order to keep gamma positive, it's got to be less than one. Cool. And, and there are a lot of easy things that you guys can check at home. We're running a little late, so maybe we won't check them on the board. But for instance, if alpha is equal to zero, well, what does that mean? That means really I'm just a weighted average of B and C, so I'm, I'm sitting on the line segment between those two guys. And if two of them are equal to zero, then obviously I'm equal to the third plane. Any questions so far? Yeah. Ah, no problem. A, B, and C are just three points in 3D world. Okay. And alpha, beta, gamma are like weights associated to those three points to specify a fourth point inside of the triangle. Yeah, so those are the barycentric coordinates. Any other questions? That's excellent. That's the thing you're enthusiastic about. Interesting. Okay. Um, right, so here's our, our sort of summary of our state of affairs so far, right? We have... Uh, a nice parameterization of a triangle, and if, as long as the weights are positive and sum to one, we know we're in the inside. So what do you think, by the way, let's do a little foreshadowing. How do you think we're going to intersect a ray with a triangle? Yeah, you're going to intersect a ray with a plane, but we have a new formula for a plane here. So now we're going to plug our formula for our ray into this thing uh, and see what we can find. Okay. Um, Right, but uh, fun fact that we are not going to prove in class, but I encourage you to try at home. Um, a different way to get alpha, beta, and gamma. This is actually, I think, originally how barycentric coordinates arose. So if you were like Pythagoras and you like didn't know how to do coordinates, one way to do it is to get that you look at the triangle opposite of vertex, right? So I'm going to take my vertex, uh, my point P. Here's P. And I'm going to subdivide my triangle by drawing line segments to the three corners of the triangle, and then the weight of this vertex, I take the interior triangle opposite that vertex, and I take his area divided by the area of the entire triangle, and that will give me the barycentric of, uh, coordinate of this point. So, you know, that, that, the barycentric weight associated with that vertex for this point. Yes? Not necessarily. I mean, it could be, like, it, if I gave you a different problem, which was I gave you four points on the board and just asked you to compute the barycentric coordinates, that's how you could do it. Yeah. Which actually happens sometimes, right? So, like, in geometric design kind of software, sometimes maybe you have a triangle and you want to subdivide it. So, like, somebody pinpoints a point and now you have to do this kind of thing. Okay. Right. So, uh, there, there are many different ways to recover alpha, beta, and gamma given, like, A, B, C, and a point inside of the triangle. Right, that's like going back to your question. One of them would be this fancy area formula, but that's not the most practical thing in the world. But we are really good at solving linear systems of equations. Yeah? So, why don't we do that? Well, what do we know? We know that we can parameterize 
Uh, in fact, let's do it over here. Uh, if we label, uh, let's see, E1 is going to be B minus A. So this is E1. This is E2, C minus A, right? Then, in effect, I can parameterize my curve, or rather my triangle, in a slightly different way, right? Which is I can write um, is equal to A plus beta E1 plus gamma E2. That makes sense. So all I did was just substitute in for those differences up there. Okay, so what do I want? If I'm trying to find the barycentric coordinates of a point P, what could I do? Well, I could just set this equal to P and solve for beta and gamma here. Once I have them, I can get alpha by just subtracting two, those two numbers from one, right? Knots? Agree? Okay, so, uh, right. How big, first of all, this is a linear relationship. Do you see that for the unknowns are beta and gamma? And of course, a, E1, and E2 are actually vectors. So how many linear relationships are there really? Exactly. Yeah, that's the way to think about it, right? That really you should think of A as like a vector plus beta E1 plus gamma E2 equals P. <laughs> Visually, right? These are vectors with like three rows in them. And so, uh, really, I have three different relationships that are coupling uh, beta and gamma together. What went wrong? Uh, yeah. How did we get P? P. Oh. Cool. So Darius actually answered the question I was trying to. Uh, in fact, th the reason Darius is confused is because of the contradiction in this, this formula here. <laughs> You're just ahead of the game today. Uh, right, which is, um, we have three relationships here, uh, but two unknowns. And the reason is that implicitly by assuming that alpha was one minus the other two guys, I was assuming that P was in the plane of the triangle. Right? But, you know, the way that I've written this problem down so far, there's no, there's no reason why I should assume that. Right? So, so, so to step back, the sort of problem we're trying to solve right now is, given the vertices of a triangle and a point P, find the barycentric coordinates of P relative to that triangle. And, and so essentially, what I did by writing this expression here was assuming the P is inside of the triangle, which we really haven't, we really shouldn't do, right? Okay, good eye. All right, so uh, in any event, let's say that I give you that additional piece of information that seems buzzing on me. Uh, the, the, the P is in the plane of the triangle. I still have too many relationships, so I have to do something to get rid of them. There are a lot of options, right? I mean, one thing I could do would be just take the first two rows. And that's largely sensible, except if all the action, action is in the z-coordinate or something. Right? So like maybe your points are in the yz plane, then that first relationship won't tell me anything. So a more typical thing to do is to take that expression and take its dot product on both sides with uh, e1 and e2. Right? So I can take... Uh, Yeah, so let's say that I subtract P from both sides, so it's like A plus beta E1 plus gamma E2 minus P equals zero. Okay, what can I do? Well, I can, I can write the following. E1 dot product A plus beta E1 plus gamma E2 minus And similarly, E2 dot product A plus beta E1 plus gamma E2 minus P equals zero. Yeah. And of course, dot products distribute over sums. I see confused eyebrows. Remember that this is vector, 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 scalar, scalar. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So, what do I get when I do that? Well, should we write it out? Yeah, we should write it out. Okay, so let's, uh, let's do that. By the way, in the slides, I use an alternative notation for dot product, which are these like little angle brackets. That's a pretty typical thing to do in this area, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, so we might as well isolate all of our unknowns on one side and all of our constants on the other. Okay, so let's take our first expression. The unknowns are these two middle terms, right? So it's like beta... Uh, E1 dot E1 plus 
um, gamma E1 dot E2 equals uh, P uh, minus A dot E1. Cool. And similarly, uh, I suppose I can just take all the E1s and replace them. So it's uh, beta E2 dot E1 plus gamma E2 dot E2 equals P minus uh, A dot E2. And I can rearrange this thing as a matrix system, right? By uh, writing beta and gamma in a vector like that. So the coefficient of beta here is E1 dot E1, E1 dot E2, E2 dot E1, E2 dot E2. And on the right hand side, we have P minus A dot E1 and P minus A. Now we have a linear system to recover our parasensual coordinates. Okay. And one thing you can convince yourself, I think, is that um, this matrix is invertible anytime E1 and E2 are not the same vector twice, which is a good thing, right? Because remember in that other example where like maybe I just took the first two rows of my relationship up here, there's sometimes when it's not invertible, but still I should be able to get alpha, beta, and gamma. In this system, that's, that's, that's not the case. Right? Um, and essentially the reason why is I did a change of, secretly did a change of coordinates that put me in the plane of the triangle. Okay. So, if I want to intersect a ray with a triangle, what do I have to do? Well, it's all kinds of fun. So remember that the triangle is defined using this relationship on the right-hand side for unknown beta and gamma. My ray is the origin plus t times the direction. How many unknowns are there in this whole expression? Three. Do you see that? Because there's beta and gamma which is the location in the triangle's coordinates of where my ray hit the triangle. And then there's T, which is the location along the ray where my ray hits the triangle. And so this is kind of like target practice, right? Like the triangle is like trying to choose his barycentric coordinates to intercept the ray as it hits into the plane. That makes sense? Now, what's the nice thing here? How many unknowns are there? Are there three? How many rows are there secretly in this linear system? Three, right? Because these are vectors with three coordinates. So this is just a linear system of equations in disguise. I'm not going to write this one on the board because I'm feeling lazy and we already got a late start. Uh, but uh, when, you, when you write it like this, um, what do you do? Well, now you can invert to get beta, gamma, and t. Uh, and uh, there are many ways to do that. One of them that you probably learned in linear algebra class is Kramer's rule. Personally, if I were to implement this, I would use somebody else's code for inverting a 3 by 3 matrix rather than painstakingly typing this hateful uh, piece of mathematics into the computer. I never really could understand Kramer's rule. I don't, intuitively, it doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, I mean it's correct mathematically, but it's a weird formula. Okay, so th this is uh, the barycentric uh, uh, intersection formula, and so essentially, what do we learn? If I want to intersect a ray with a triangle, I can solve this linear system for beta, gamma, and t, Am I done? Not quite. I need to look at beta and gamma. Also, what's that? exactly. Check that they're between 0 and 1. Maybe also compute alpha, which is 1 minus the other 2. Check that that one's also between 0 and 1. And then we're good. OK? And then we can say, like, hurrah, we've hit the triangle. And now we can just reuse our, our plane uh, intersection code, right? So like, remember, we talked last time about how to return the normal to the plane and so on. One of the nice side benefits of using barycentric uh, interpolation is like, let's say that on the vertices of my triangle, I have like a color for my mesh and I want to interpolate that color in a nice smooth way along the, uh, the triangle face. Well, think about what the barycentric coordinates of a point are. They're kind of like the weighted average of these three corner points that gives me the point in the interior. So if I want the color at the point in the interior, I can just reuse those same three weights to get a, a, a color at that point, right? So this is a nice, easy way, I, I, I see it. When, when I'm doing my, my rendering to take a pervertex color uh, and interpolate it smoothly by just computing the color on the fly once I've, I've, I've done that ray triangle intersection. Yes? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. In some sense. So the, the question here was like, is this somehow assuming that like the red, the red, blue, green should be interpolated in like an equally weighted way? And the answer is yes. I mean, you can see it's kind of smoothly moving that way. That's because there's, there's nothing about our, our barycentric coordinates that's really biasing it toward any of the three vertices. I do think there are weighted versions of that, but I, I don't know offhand. Yeah. Any other uh, questions so far? Excellent. Um, yeah, so that, that's basically it. And, and, and there's our, our basic uh, story here, is, is you get your point. If I want to interpolate your color, I just reuse the same alpha, beta, gamma weights a second time. And this is, by the way, I'm sure you guys have all seen like poorly rendered triangle meshes where you do your shading computation per vertex and then you, get the, you can like, see the triangles in the mesh really easily. This is probably what's causing that. Right? So like, you did your dot product with the direction to the light bulb once per vertex and then interpolated that color to the inside of a triangle. Um, really, in these days, now that we know how to do shaders and all this fancy math, this kind of an interpolation is, is less important than it used to be because you can just do your shading computation per pixel rather than like trying to do some savings by doing it per vertex on your mesh, which is typically a little bit easier. Okay, so any, uh, any questions so far? I'm sorry our slides are a little small today. Excellent. Okay, so that concludes our, our basic computations when it comes to ray casting. You can see it's, it's really straightforward. It's the same name of the game for every, you know, you, you propose a new primitive shape, like we already have, what, planes, spheres, and triangles. Maybe I want to do a hyperboloid or like a weird sheet. What do I do? I work out the equations of how to intersect a ray with that particular object, and then we're good. Right? And so, so they, basically that's it. But typically ray tracers don't implement that many primitives for reasons that we're going to see in just a few minutes. That with just a few primitives, we can build all kinds of cool shapes. Uh, and, and so that's, that's really good enough. To step sideways a little bit, so we already talked about this a bit on our nano quiz, and um, we'll continue uh, talking about it now. So um, notice that in our implementation so far, there's a really nice sort of division of labor, right? Which is that, what do I have to do for any given object in my scene? You know, like whether it's a sphere, a triangle, Darius, anything. I, I just have to intersect it with a ray and, and, and figure out the, the T at which my ray intersects it, and then have this thing return the normal and maybe some shading information. Does it matter what kind of object it is? No, right? And so hopefully you guys have all encountered object-oriented programming before. Hey, there's a nice abstraction here, which is that the only information the ray tracer needs is there's a piece of geometry that knows how to intersect itself with rays. Right? And so there's a really nice object-oriented design here um, that, that is very typical in implementing these, these tools. Okay, so um, here's the, the basic setup. I believe this is exactly the uh, syntax that will be in your next assignment, um, which is you might have a class object 3D, and it has a function called intersect, which takes an array and just tells you a Boolean, like yes or no, did I intersect? And if it did, it maybe fills in this data structure, which I think we call a hit record, which tells you information like, you know, the time that intersected, the normal, and maybe the shading, like the texture of the sphere at that point, or the object rather. Right? And, and we've already talked about how to intersect that for a plane and a sphere, and maybe an individual triangle, and then maybe you build a triangle mesh out of individual triangles. There's a lot of really nice abstraction that can happen here. Right? And notice that this plays very well with the scene graph uh, description we talked about a few weeks ago. Um, right, we can do the same thing for a camera, right? A camera is the thing that generates rays. So like, given a pixel location, the camera is the thing that gives you a ray. So there's a really nice abstraction that goes into object-oriented programming. If you're not used to this style of programming, you will be by the end of your next assignment. Um, Incidentally, we are also going to use one kind of weird C++ feature, which is passing by reference. For those of you who are used to Python, you're probably not used to seeing this. But essentially, it's useful for this function to return more than one thing. Right? Like the primary thing that matters is like, yes or no, did I intersect? But then if I intersected, maybe I want to return some additional information. So we're going to do a very typical C++ hack, which is probably the number one source of like memory leaks and security problems in, in C++ code which is I'm going to pass in an argument by reference, meaning that if I edit that variable inside of my code here, whoever called it will also have that variable edited. It doesn't get copied. On the, so it's, it, it sits on the heap and not the stack. Um, well, not necessarily, but that's what, whatever. 
Okay, so, so in your, your next assignment, you'll first implement an array caster. You've got everything you need for that. We give you the basic classes for array, what we call a hit record, which is like a T, the material, maybe the normal, the thing you ran into. Um, and you're going to do basically everything else. And this is a fun assignment because like, it's pretty rewarding. You get to like, actually see stuff. Um, if you like these kinds of things and you want to learn how to intersect array with like, every possible object in the, the known universe, um, there are a lot of good textbooks about the, my favorite, and actually my, my first graphics textbook ever is this middle one here. Um, just this little itty bitty book where he actually just walks you through the, uh, the steps of uh, building a ray tracer. If you prefer sledgehammers, there's a very famous ray tracer called PBRT, which is what, physically based ray tracing, um, which is a ray tracer that compiles in LaTeX and in C++, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So it is a uh, simultaneously a textbook and a ray tracer. Uh, and you can go buy this thing. I have it on my shelf. It just came out with a new edition. It's pretty fun to look at. OK, any questions so far about the, the basic uh, sort of abstraction that goes into implementing a ray tracer? OK, so now we're going to step sideways a little bit and talk about how to build more complex objects out of some really simple ones that, that we have on hand. And this is the main technology underneath most of computer-aided design software. Right? So if you download you know, AutoCAD or other computer-aided design software, <laughs> GrabCAD, some of these other things, um, this is one of the really nice ways to do uh, uh, rendering, um, ray tracing, where essentially what I'm going to do is build up a complicated object by doing sort of editing operations using a, a, a few uh, simple primitives. What we're going to see is this is one of the beautiful applications of ray tracing because we're going to render a shape without ever explicitly representing it. What I mean by that is so far, like when you want to render a sphere, what did you do? You like wrote down the equation of a sphere. If I wanted like the intersection of two spheres, so it's like some weird oblong shape with like a weird edge on it, would it be so easy to like parameterize that shape? Or like write it as a triangle mesh? No, but in a ray tracer it is easy. And that's what's so cool. Um, I really love this stuff. Okay, so, um, Right, so here's uh, the basic idea of constructive solid geometry, CSG, if you're in the know, which is, uh, many of you guys have uh, encountered binary, like, Boolean operations before. I mean, I've done Boolean algebra before. I see hands that are not up, and you're, like, literally killing me inside, because I know that they should be up. Okay, so, uh, right, in constructive solid geometry, for every Boolean operator that you're used to when you're, like, dealing with binary numbers, there's a similar Boolean operator that you can do on a shape, yeah? So for instance, the union is probably the easiest one. In some sense, we've already talked about how to render a union of shapes, right? Like, just render all the shapes. But in CSG, we can do more interesting stuff. Like, I can do a minus, which is like A minus B. So I took a spherical bite out of this cube, or uh, an intersection, which is A intersect B, which would be, you can kind of see the sphere intersecting with the cube surface here. Right? These are complicated surfaces built out of really simple stuff. And in fact, if you look in those typical file formats for like AutoCAD, that kind of software, what they do behind the scenes is they keep track of a giant Boolean expression, which is building up your shape out of these little, little primitives. And indeed, if you guys have ever played with this software, that's probably more or less how you model shapes. This is different, by the way, than like ZBrush, where you like have a mesh and you're messing with the vertices. Okay. Right, so the typical representation in co constructive solid geometry, like let's say I wanted to make this very like 1980s looking, uh, you know, table for my, my living room. Uh, one way that I could do that would be take a sphere, maybe, you know, what can I do? Well, I, I need to get these planar slices out of the side, so maybe I, you know, intersect it with a cube, um, or, or rather I take the intersection of a cube and a sphere that gives me a cube sphere object. And now what I'm going to do is subtract out this plus sign, right? So I can get these cool holes here, right? And the plus sign is itself the union of a bunch of cylinders. And so you end up with this giant tree, which conveniently is called a CSG tree, which is the typical representation of a shape uh, in uh, CAD. By the way, let's say that I gave you this representation, which is very simple, right? I mean, you could store it in like a very easy file format. And I asked you to extract a triangle mesh of this shape. Yeah, is this an easy or a hard problem? This is a very hard problem. Yeah, this is a problem you want to avoid, like the plague. However, uh, it is implemented in most CAD systems because, like, maybe now I want to take that cool shape and export it to my video game 
video games can't typically do ray tracing, at least they couldn't a couple years ago. Uh, so then you need a triangle mesh. Uh, and that's a very tough uh, geometry problem. In fact, a harder geometry problem is let's say I give you a triangle mesh of this shape and I say, can you reverse engineer the CSG tree uh, for that shape, even if I told you it came out of my CAD software? That is basically a research problem. In fact, the state-of-the-art tool was proposed about a year ago by Wojtek Matusek, who is in our ECS department here. So you can see, I think they call it inverse uh, CAD or inverse CSG. We're not very creative with our naming around here. Uh, and, and it's useful because now you can like, you know, maybe somebody exported a model and then lost their file or something you want to, you know, recover the 3D shape. There's also room for machine learning there, by the way, because maybe your triangle mesh like was never modeled with CSG and you want to uh, guess something there. You can get really complicated shapes this way, right? Like here's a cute, what would you call that? Votive, I guess which is constructed purely using these different things. You're just punching things out of a sphere. Okay, I, I love this topic. This is sick. I just, I just think it's so cool. Um, okay, so, so here's a, a, a bit of a schematic of what's going on. So if I have two overlapping shapes, A and B, then, then the basic things that we need to implement are union, intersection, and subtraction. You can get mostly other uh, Boolean operations the same way. Um, and, and you can think of them as sort of a bunch of different cases, right? Like, so union would be points on either of the two surfaces. Another one would be points that are like inside of one and outside of the other, and, and so on. Okay, this is the kind of thing where if I start talking about it, it's going to sound like a big blob of words that doesn't matter to you guys. But I think it's pretty intuitive how to like define the intersection of two shapes. Okay. Any ideas? How could I implement this in a ray tracer? Oh, man, I hate this part. Yes. Yeah. Sure. So that would be a reasonable uh, kind of approach. Would be maybe I do an, uh, I add a new function to my object class. One is intersect, and the other is is this point inside of me. Yep, that's a, that's a reasonable approach. Turns out that can be, you can, you can actually get away with just implementing one function. So, so far, we, we, we compute the time that a ray runs into a surface. What else could we do? What matters for inside versus outside? I see you, I'm purposely ignoring you. Not, but, but, but we're friends, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yes, I saw your hand. Exactly! Well, what we're going to have our ray tracer do is not just tell you when the T hits for when it goes into that shape, we keep track of a second T for when it goes out. And maybe if your shape is non-convex, it gives you a whole list of little intervals where your, your ray runs into it. But notice that, by the way, all of the, the primitive shapes we've talked about so far, there's never, I mean, it's just a single interval for enter and exit. We have kind of purposefully haven't given you any, any uh, shape where that's not the case. That's exactly right. So if we want to implement CSG, one thing to notice is that when I intersect a ray, you know, the same way when I intersected a ray with a sphere, I got like maybe two numbers. Now we're going to turn that bug into a feature and keep them both. Hopefully that's what you had in mind. Good. Uh, right. And so what does that allow me to do? Well, now if I intersect my ray with sphere A, I get an interval like that. I intersect a ray with sphere B, e, I get an interval like that. If I want the intersection of these two objects, I just winnow down that interval. Um, to, to keep track of those two points. And so we're going to have a hit record associated with both sides. Just sneaky. I really like this stuff. Okay. Um, right, so if I want to test, uh, uh, you know, these assorted uh, CSG operations, the basic observation here is that it's, it's kind of hard to determine whether points are inside or outside of a solid shape. Okay, for a sphere, maybe not, but like, if I gave you the triangle mesh of the bunny and I said, like, are you inside or outside of the bunny? I think it'd be kind of a tough calculation to do. But what's not so hard to do is just intersect a ray with a bunch of things and keep track of the first and the last time. Right? And that's basically what's going on here. OK. Uh, right. And so that's, that's what uh, we're going to do, um, is just keep track of a bunch of intervals and then uh, start doing just interval arithmetic instead of arithmetic on 3D shapes. And the cool thing is that when you render, I see it, uh, when, you, when you render, does it matter that you never explicitly represented the shape? No, like you just have to, to keep track of this stuff. Yes? Does the point of all 
polygon thing, like apply it to like 3D shapes as well, like where you can like tell if you're inside of a polygon. To, like, oh yeah, the checking of a point is inside of a, a triangle mesh is a hard problem. Okay. But computing the time at which a ray intersects a triangle mesh is not such a hard problem. Right? We already did it, in fact. Yeah. 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 I, I was just like yeah, 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 no, the pictures are 2D only because I'm bad at drawing. Yeah, great question. Yeah, any other? Yes. Uh huh. Then you have the entry point is basically equal to the Yep. You're right. We're going to cover that in a minute. So, the, so boundary cases are a huge headache in rendering. Uh, and often when you see artifacts and rendered images, they're right at the corners of stuff. Essentially, our fix in this class for that problem will be to add a fudge factor to our calculations. Um, there are people, like if you're using this for your like really detailed, solar panel thing and you're trying to predict the power output and that last little bit really matters. There are people that do really, really compu tricky computations to like say, well, I really don't want to fudge this. I, mean, I really want to get it right. Um, in which case, uh, your life gets a lot worse, right? You need to do like infinite precision arithmetic and all these crazy things that geometry people worry about. Um, okay. Right. And so basically this is just a 1D problem per ray. And, and the basic thing to note here is that it is very hard to get an explicit representation of a triangle mesh, even though this calculation is not so hard. Okay, so let's do an example. So now, let's say that I want to do these different Boolean operations on our two shapes. Again, this is 2D only because I'm lazy, not because there's something special about 2D. And I tell you that the interval in which I'm in shape A is from t equals 1 to t equals 3. And similarly, the interval where I'm in shape B is t equals 2 to t equals 6. Let's say I want to do a minus b. So first of all, what would that be? That would be like this semicircle. So what interval is that going to be? 1, 2, right? Because it's kind of like the point that I hit a and then the point that I enter b, right? So that's 1, 2. Let's keep track of our answers because I'm noticing on the next slide I didn't reveal them one at a time. Okay, so uh, let's say I do A union B. Then, what, first of all, when do I enter that? Well, I enter that when I hit A, so that's going to be 1. When do I exit? 6, 1, 6. This isn't fair. Usually I have the slide preview, and I can check uh, our answers as, as we're talking here, but I'm, I'm, we're doing it live today. Okay, and if I want to intersect the two, right, so now I'm like this kind of grayish shape here. Well, when do I enter the intersection is when I enter B. Yeah, so that's 2. And when do I exit the intersection? 3. Three. Okay, let's see if we got it right. 2, 3. Uh-oh. A minus B. Oh, you're right. There's a typo here. I'm sorry. Yeah, I think we were correct and the slide is slightly wrong. Yeah, so we'll, we'll go back and fix this uh, in a bit and I will put this somewhere so I don't forget. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's why we do these things on the board. I'm just having a lot of trouble today, guys. I'm sorry. Your professor is a human and sometimes we just have one of those days. Okay, so uh, in any event, uh, returning to our question here, precision is a big problem in ray tracing. And it seems like a boundary case. But what's the problem? There's a lot of pixels on your screen. So the chances of hitting one of those boundary cases is actually not so small. Yeah? Uh, and in fact, like if I'm rendering a triangle mesh with a million triangles and I'm on a screen with a megapixel image, that's a lot of chances to hit like the corner of a sphere or a triangle. Yeah? Uh, and that's really a problem for this interval arithmetic business because, uh, well, it's not clear what I should do there. Um, and, and moreover, everything we've implemented in this class is in double precision floating point. It could be that like my enter time is actually after my exit time or something just because I computed them differently and some bad rounding happened or something. I doubt that that would happen in practice, but you never know. You've got to worry about these things. Um, Another typical issue happens when your eyeball is like right on top of a shape you're trying to render, right? which happens in video games all the time. Um, so basically, in, in, in whenever you do ray tracing, 
a very typical thing to do is to say like, if that interval where I intersect something is less than some small constant that my ray tracer has hard coded somewhere because we're shameful adults here, then I just don't return anything. I say it doesn't intersect. Or similarly, if I intersect and my t is like 0 .000000, like 27 times 1, then maybe I say it doesn't intersect because chances are there's just a numerical bug. Right? And this is one of these things that is basically just a giant hack, but this is a very typical thing to do. Um, so the number one source of this particular bug, I think it's, you'd have to have really bad luck to graze the side of a sphere or something, but you could probably construct it by like putting a sphere aligned with the pixel grid. But a, a more typical uh, scenario is um, the following, which is I'm doing my ray tracing and I make a secondary ray because I want to do reflection, right? And so what do I do? I generate a new, you know, so like maybe I have this shiny sphere here, so I hit this guy, and I generate another ray that's coming back out. We're going to talk about how to do that later. What do you think the first object that that ray is going to hit will be? Well, probably the sphere, right? Because that's the closest one. Um, so a very typical thing to do would be to take that ray and offset it a little bit along its, its normal direction. So I encourage you guys, when you are doing your homework assignment, to add epsilons with abandon. Uh, like any time the, the things seem to be looking weird, um, this is probably the, the, the main kind of a bug, yeah? Um, now, of course, if you work at Autodesk and you are implementing mental ray, I would give you very different advice, which is be careful and actually think through this stuff. But actually, I think most implementations of ray traces really do just have some fun factor built in. I mean, here's another case where, like, intersecting array with the, the, the corner of two triangles, you've got to decide which one to render. Or even worse, maybe your epsilon is chosen in a bad way and you go through it and render whatever is behind. Um, so those are the kinds of things you have to think through very carefully. Incidentally, when I taught Stanford, uh, they, at Stanford, they have a, their graphics class is sort of flipped backward from MIT's. They do uh, rasterization first and then render and then ray tracing. And uh, my favorite assignment to give, which got so much student protest I had to remove it, was to render two triangles that share an edge and have there be no gap and no overlap in the pixels between the two triangles. So in rasterization, right, you just you choose which pixels are on the inside and the outside. And if you want to do that, then you have to get your rounding correct. And it's just evil. Oh, it's so much fun. Okay. Um, I think there's like one student ever that, that got it right. Okay. So any, any questions so far about our uh, sort of basic object-oriented setup and uh, how we're going to build in a fudge factor? Yeah. Sure. Uh, the answer is just about everything. Um, so uh, when this, when you, if you have that interval of intersection, if it's smaller than epsilon, you probably throw it away. Uh, when you generate a, if it's like the two things that you're going through are really, really, really close, you might just say it doesn't intersect. Okay. Or when you generate that secondary ray because you're doing reflection, you probably displace it a little off the surface to avoid that scenario where you intersect the object you just bounced off of. Um, so I encourage you to just add epsilons everywhere. Chances are those things are so far off from a perceptual di uh, uh, difference that it'll make in your eye. That's sort of an okay thing to do. Yeah, cool. Um, I'm a little um, easy on like, the big difference in how we address the universe versus triangle mm. um, So for CSG, you don't force up the triangle method, you don't try to do um, overhaul. It's a good question. So like, for instance, can I do CSG with triangle meshes? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, yeah, so um, typically CSG is implemented with a bunch of primitives that are very easy to do that inside-outside calculation, or like a box, a sphere, that kind of thing. Um, but you're also, by the way, how do you get a box? You can get it with CSG with a bunch of planes, right? where the enter time is finite and the exit time is infinity. Um, but in any event, um, for triangle mesh, it's a little bit trickier, right? Because um, well, so it's not clear how to get that interval a priori, right? So a very simple way to do it is to keep triangles that are oriented so that you know whether they're inside or outside, like which, which direction is facing the outside world. And now you can intersect your ray with every one of the triangles and kind of keep your, your interval in that fashion. Actually, I guess you don't even need it to be oriented necessarily. Um, where you're going to run into trouble for CSG with a triangle mesh is there's nothing stopping the triangle mesh from intersecting itself. Um, 
and then deciding what's inside and what's outside becomes a little bit of a judgment call. <laughs> so I think typically that's not implemented in a ray tracer, but you can imagine some, some reasonable ways you could go about it. Yeah? Yeah, I mean, and that's probably a pretty reasonable way to, to do There's nothing complex about that, right? You could. Uh, so the, the, the suggestion here is intersect a bunch of, just randomly generate a bunch of rays with a shape that gives you implicitly a bunch of points on the CSG shape, for sure. It also gives you normals, um, which can be useful for a lot of surface reconstruction tools, and then reconstruct it that way. That's a pretty noisy representation. So in computer aided design, you really like control over quality. Um, and so resolving like the sharp edges on these things is, is very critical, and that's where things really go wrong. But yeah, if you wanted like a quick and dirty way to do it, that would be totally reasonable. Also controlling the sampling rate on the surface using that strategy would be pretty tricky. Yeah. Any other uh, questions here? It's I hand, but maybe it was like, okay. Cool. But do you guys see how like the, the, the really cool thing about ray tracing is you start with a really simple algorithm and then you just start adding like little changes to it. like. Instead of just keeping hit time, keep enter and exit time. Or, you know, instead of just returning yes or no, did I hit, return a bit of shading information. With like small edits to your code, you can get much, much more complicated geometry and much more complicated uh, shading we'll see in future lectures. Okay, so our final topic, just to keep, make sure that you guys are, 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 are as confused as possible, uh, we'll talk about everybody's least favorite topic in ray tracing which is a good point of frustration on your assignment, uh, which is uh, transformations, which you've already seen uh, is a giant source of headache in, in your homework too here. Uh, so in uh, raycasting, there, you, you have a very similar scenario to what we've already talked about, right? I probably have a whole scene graph that's describing like a hierarchy of matrices that are, are, are describing all the objects in my scene, and I want to render these objects. Um, which makes a lot of sense, right? If I have a sphere, I don't just want my sphere at the origin, I'd like to translate my sphere to other places. Uh, and so in order to do that, I need to be able to incorporate these different matrix transformations into my ray tracing pipeline. Here's where this object-oriented thing is going to be super cool. Because what I'm going to do is, like, let's say that I want an ellipsoid, right? So I want a sphere, but I want to stretch it with a factor of two. Well, what could I do? I could make a new ellipsoid primitive and, and like, work through the ellipsoid ray intersection formula, but that sounds like a lot of work. So what could I do instead is keep track of a transformation to the points on the sphere. But there's a problem, which is my sphere is like this totally brain dead object, right? The only thing it knows how to do is take an array and say like, hooray, you hit me, right? It doesn't know anything about a linear transformation. I, 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 you know, my object oriented thing, I, I'm, I'm, I'm out of luck. So if I can't transform the sphere, what can I do? transform the ray the other way around. Sneaky, huh? So cool. Okay, so uh, this is a, 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 an idea uh, that's called instancing. So if you want to render a like, weird pagan stick figure ritual, uh, you can do that. <laughs> or you can render more practical scenes. I'm not sure why I found that one on the internet. Um, but in, in, in any event, the idea of instancing is that like, Really, you know, I just want to store maybe one piece of geometry and then repeat it a bunch of times. Uh, and if that piece of geometry knows how to intersect itself with rays, I'd still like to be able to compose it with transformations, repeat, all that good stuff. Um, and so that's, that's what we need to, to be able to deal with. Uh, and so uh, the basic idea here, which we've already seen when we talked about scene graphs, is that we'd like to store one object and use it often. Right? Now this is a pretty blatant example. Uh, where our, our little top hat stick figures are, are worshiping the, the maypole here. But oftentimes, especially in the background of a lot of animated content, it's really just the same object stamped a bunch of times because you can't see it anyway. Um, these are called assets, right? Assets are like little pieces of geometry in your scene. Okay, so what are we going to do? Well, every time... Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> every time we have a new instance, right, a new object in our scene, so maybe what do I do? I make an instance class with a matrix and just an abstract object inside of this new class, which is itself an object. Is that cool? Because object-oriented programming lets you do stuff like that. 
um, which is basically just going to store a transformation matrix so that I can like rotate, stretch, do all that, that cool stuff to our shapes, just like we've already done. Okay, so what am I going to do? Well, you know, in, in my uh, uh, setup, it's not so hard, right? <laughs> Um, okay, right. Uh, you know, if you have, you, 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 you. <laughs> if I have a, a data type which can store an object, essentially all I'm going to do is just wrap it with some, some transformation. Right? By the way, this kind of meta programming language is pretty typical in, in specifying a scene. Okay. Um, Right, and, and, and we can do this, you know, implicitly, even if we're storing an object like a sphere um, or an ellipsoid, you know, with a major and a minor axis here, maybe behind the scenes is really just a sphere with a, uh, some additional information there. Okay, so thankfully we've already done this calculation, right? So uh, what do we need to do? Well, we just need a matrix that takes us from world space to object space, right? And that's what we'll store in our instance class. It's just that matrix, yeah? So if I want to transform my ray, what do I do? I take my, the origin and the direction of my ray, and I just multiply it by that matrix, and then I intersect that new guy with my non-transformed object. That makes sense? By the way, why can't I reuse the same matrix for the origin and the direction? I need to use homogeneous coordinates, right? So for the direction, I'll need a zero in the end. Because if I have a translation, I really should account for that in, the, in the, the origin of the ray, right? So like, I can transfer a sphere up three units, or I can leave the sphere alone and transform the source of the ray down three units. This is a great source of, uh, you know, dyslexia here. Okay. Um, right, so if I have a matrix that goes the other way, I just hit, you know, with the inverse of the, the matrix instead of the, the forward one. If I'm really sneaky... Does the direction of my ray need to be a unit vector? No, right? Essentially, we've just been computing these t values. I just have to be careful how to interpret that t, right? So if my ray is like two units long, then like the t that I'll need to intersect the first shape will be different, but like the ordering would still be the same, right? Like the first shape it would hit would be no different, right? And the nice thing is, if I do this transformation to the ray and then compute the intersection with the untransformed object, actually the same t works in the, in the original space. I don't have to uh, change the t-value. So this is pretty convenient for, for, for ray tracing. Um, yeah, so the other, so by the way, in your homework, you have a choose your own adventure. You can either do the correct thing or you can do something that'll make your life a lot harder. So the thing that would make your life a lot harder would be to, every time you apply transformation like this, take the direction of your ray and rescale it to be unit length again. That's fine, but then Remember, you have this outer thing that wants to know the first t that your ray hits into, but by virtue of having rescaled your direction, you've now got to rescale your t the other way. So rather than doing that, just writing code that from the start can cope with non-unit length vectors for the direction of your ray is like very clearly the, the, the better way to go. Um, cool. Okay, and that's, that's what this, see, it's got highly recommended and like a little explosion here. I'm sorry. Okay. So, once I get that intersection point, it's fine. what do I have to do? Well, I have to, uh, it's, it's like Halloween in here. Once I, once I get the intersection point, um, I do have to take that point, like the XYZ coordinates, and transform them back to world coordinates, right? So I have to multiply by the inverse of whatever matrix I used to take my ray into local coordinates. And what do we know from two lectures ago? What do I do to the normal to the surface? Multiply by the inverse transpose of that same matrix. Right, so now notice that in this one computation of intersecting a sphere with a transformed shape, I need the matrix, its inverse, and its inverse transpose. Because right? I've got to take the ray, put it in local coordinates, intersect, take the intersection point, put it back in the world coordinates, and while I'm at it, take the normal vector to the shape in its local coordinates and put that in world coordinates too using the inverse transpose. How's that for a headache? Yeah. So anyway, that's, that's what goes on in this stuff. Conceptually, it's not too hard, but as you can imagine, it's a great source of, of, of bugs in your code. So proceed carefully, because um, that's, that's sort of a typical uh, stumbling point. 
Okay, and we already did this calculation here. So I think we've had enough torture for one day, so maybe we'll, we'll call it. I will revise the one, the, the miscalculation of the slides. I apologize for that and, and post uh, a slightly edited slides uh, in just a few minutes here. I promise in our next class, after I, in just a few moments, walk down to our management office and have a few chat about starting the previous class on time and giving me AV equipment that works, uh, starting in, in the uh, next class, we'll be back on stable footing, okay? So I will see you guys on Thursday. Don't forget your assignments. Don't forget that you got a quiz coming up soon-ish. Yeah? Uh, and we'll see you uh, soon. And my apologies for kind of a hot mess of a class today.